everyone. I am honored uh, for you to be joining me today. Uh, my name is Rose Hurwitz. I am a Pulitzer-nominated journalist and the founder of Women to Follow. I'm uh, uh, honored to host um, this episode number 22 of my Women to Follow show with my terrific guests, award-winning authors Nora, Ray Le Nora, Nora Raleigh Baskin and Gabe Polisner. We'll meet them shortly. Just want to give a shout out and a thank you to my producer, Stefan Kaplan, who's doing a great job as we speak. Uh, and I also want to thank my sponsor, uh, Women in Technology International, uh, which is one of the biggest networks for women in tech. Uh, please join us on, we'll be on Facebook, Twitter, uh, my account at Rose Horowitz 31 LinkedIn, or my Woman to Follow, and on my Woman to Follow YouTube channel. And tonight, special treat, we'll also be streaming the show on Gabe Polisner's Facebook account and her author account, which is uh, GabePolisner.com. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Gay, and uh, appreciate it. Uh, tell us where you're tuning in from. Uh, I'd love to hear any questions you have for our authors, uh, and you're welcome to comment or ask questions on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube. And I'll be talking about writing and publishing with uh, our two authors um, who've written, uh, I guess, a total of 22 books for young adults. Uh, Nora, Nora Raleigh Baskin is the author of 15 novels for young adults. Uh, she also teaches writing in schools and prisons, and she's the founder of WordOnion.us. Uh, she received the American Library Association Schneider Family Book Award for her book, Anything But Typical, uh, which depicts how a boy with autism struggles to find ways to fit in. Uh, Gay Polisner is the author of seven books for young adults. Her novel, The Memory of Things, received the 2010 Golden Archer Award from Wisconsin's uh, Children's Choice. Uh, and in, the, in this book, In the Memory of Things, um, on the morning of September 11, 2001, 16-year-old uh, Kyle Donahue sees the first tower of the World Trade Center collapse from the window of Stuyvesant High School. Uh, and um, Baskin, Nora, has also written uh, a story for young adults about 9-11 titled 9-10, A September 11th Story. Uh, and it looks at the days leading up to the tragic events of September 11th and how that day impacted the lives of four middle school students. Um, and most recently, the authors co-authored uh, Consider the Octopus. Um, they've also co-authored Seven Clues to Home. Uh, and where, where can you find them? You can find Nora Raleigh Baskin at Nora Lay B on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, hi, Nora. Hi. Hi, Rose. Hi. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. Um, and so for Nora, you can also find uh, lots of all her books uh, and, and uh, information on her website, which is norabaskin.com. And hi, Gay. Thanks so Hello. much for joining us. Hi, Nora. Hi, <laughs> Gay. <laughs> Little party on Friday night. <laughs> uh, so Gay, you can find on her Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram account, and she's at Gay, G-A-E-P-O-L, and her website is um, the same, her name, uh, .com. So Gay, po Gay Polisner, right? On um, .com. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and let's see. How can I, let me ask you first. I think it's so interesting that you've collaborated, and I'm sure many of our viewers are wondering how that how that goes. So, what led to this collaboration for your two books? Uh, the the seven. Wait, what is the first? The, the second one. Um, the first one is seven clues to home. Um, yes. The second one is consider the octopus that just came out in yay, April. April. Okay. So how did that how did that happen that you collaborated? You want to take that, Nora? <laughs> uh, sure, I'll take it. Um, how did we? Well, we met. Uh, Gay and I met when we had both written books that took place during nine eleven in the days before okay. or during. So we met. Um, we met at a book talk and we both were like, oh, I have a book coming out about 9-11. And we became friends and we just decided to try and write. I mean, there's a whole story about how we wrote 
Seven Clues to Home or why we wrote Seven Clues to Home that Gay is better at telling. But mm -hmm. the intro, the preamble to it is that we were friends and we thought about writing a book together. We had written an adult novel together that didn't really go anywhere, that didn't sell. So um, maybe Gay has a lot more, I don't know, you have that story better about why we wrote Seven <laughs> Clues to Home. So, well, the, the first manuscript that we worked on, the adult manuscript, was really right after the 2016 election. Okay. Um, we were both feeling pretty much like our creative energy was not there, and we were lamenting that to one another. And that was when we had said, maybe we should just write something together so we can kind of egg each other on and inspire each other. And so we had written the adult novel and after that we were we we were so used to working together and we were like do we take a break or do we work on something else together and we had batted about this idea for seven clues to home about a book that centered on a scavenger hunt and nora said remember that scavenger hunt idea and so we we returned to that one and once we finished that and that sold to a publisher um, we once again parted ways and said, let's go work on our own stuff and suddenly found ourselves on the phone again, collaborating. So um, cool. there's a little bit of magic, I think, in our collaboration. And does that work where one of you writes a chapter and the other does, you know, then the other does? Or I'm just curious how that works itself out in, you know, reality, you know, in fact. Yeah, I can, yeah, sorry, I can answer that one really easily. Okay. Um, and people, people ask us that a lot. And I think other collaborative, collaborating authors do it differently. Um, but we start a Google Doc and we have, we each have our own character. Um, in both books, I've been the female and, and Gay's been the, the male character. She writes boy characters really, really well. So, um, that's happened both times. So I get up really early in the morning, five, four, I would go on the Google Doc. I would write my chapter, half of my chapter, whatever, usually a whole chapter. And then I would stop and Gay would wake up a little later and she would read what I wrote. She would leave comments on the Google Doc mm -hmm. and she would write her chapter. And it would just went on and on that way. Um, I think that with Seven Clues, our first book, it went like that. Just, we just, I don't think we we didn't even talk that much. We just wrote, um, but Gay took the lead because her character's dead. <laughs> We're not giving anything away. And my character is living a year later. So okay. it was easier for me because mm -hmm. I just followed what her character did. And then Gay, mm -hmm. you could tell them um, Octopus was very different because it took place at the same time. Yeah, Octopus was, was a much more challenging manuscript to write and we had decided, we had both been listening to the same WNYC radio show about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and Nora called me and said, turn on WNYC. And I said, I'm already listening. And so we started talking about writing this book set at or at the time on the <laughs> Great Pacific Garbage Patch. We soon realized you couldn't really be on it. Um, but the one thing that I had said to Nora at that time was, all right, we'll write another manuscript together and set it at the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but it has to be funny. Yeah. I, like, I really think our kids need to laugh. And mm -hmm. I don't know what we thought was funny about, you know, a, a garbage pile the size of Texas, because there's really not twice the size of Texas. There's really nothing funny about it. But we wrote a classic farce. And it was really challenging because we were really having to bounce humor off of one another and go back and forth and set up this entire um, classical farce where, you know, mistaken identity, comedy of errors, people bumping into each other and then leaving rooms. And we really tried to do sort of that classic kind of thing. So Consider the Octopus was a much more challenging venture and took us a much longer time. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, that book involved more planning or outlining or thinking ahead than, you know, one chapter, one chapter and just, you know, checking it out. 
It did. It yeah, did. It did. And, and then interestingly, we didn't sell it. Our agents put it out there and we didn't sell it for a, a little while. And then one editor wrote back and said, well, if it started here instead of at the beginning and we, we flipped it and sold it. So it took, awesome. a, it took a village. That's great. I think it's gotten uh, the time for kids uh, recommended it. It got a nine out of 10 for there. there. And uh, I saw some reviews that were uh, saying it's very poignant and explores the environment in ways that kids, I guess, need to know about. Um, and you do it in a fun way. So I guess it's, it's something they want to read. <laughs> so that's, that's awesome. Uh, so I'll ask you, Nora, I, I, I didn't know in reading the biographies, you know, if I thought maybe you both knew each other, or, you know, the, the books came, but anyway, the, the question is what, what made you write a book about 9-11 and, and, you know, did that idea, was an editor suggesting that or did you? Oh, no, no. In fact, it's interesting you asked me that because I think Gay and I are both of the opinion that, um, we write what we feel, what, what's important to us. I don't okay. think I've ever been given an idea. Okay. You never know where they'll come from. But um, for me, obviously, I, I, you know, I lived through 9-11. My kids were in middle school, like, like yours, in, in West and middle school, mm -hmm. same, same yeah. time. And, um, Various grades. <laughs> I actually, to be honest, I was watching a movie, and it was about the assassination of Bobby Kennedy and how I remembered 1968, how that affected me. And, and the movie, I knew what the ending was going to be, um, but, I, but it was so riveting. It, it's called Bobby. And I started thinking, what an amazing structure. I, I saw it as a writing challenge. Like, mm -hmm. What a challenge. You write a book where you know the ending. There's all these different characters who don't know each other. They're all going to be affected by this. And how, how did the, the filmmaker do it? And I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to do the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, but what do I, what do, what affected me and my children? And I pretty quickly said 9-11. And, um, and that, that's how I came up with the, the structure came first for me and the idea of how the world changed. That, that was, I wanted to write about how a single event can change the course of history and change our, our the world, our children grow up in that was that was my yeah, i start i started reading it and uh it was very engaging so it, it starts before 9 11. Right? yeah yeah the day before so so other you can't see the change unless you see the before you know you need the before to learn yeah. um and gay you've written uh the the wait um what is it the <laughs> the memory um, of things the memory of things. There you go. Memory. Okay. <laughs> With a beautiful cover. I just love that cover. I just, I just love it. Yeah. So uh, very different sort of reasons and, and background than Nora's. Nora's, you can hear all sorts of like curiosity about craft that made mm -hmm. her, you know, she was interested in something that she was watching a film and said, oh, I'm interested in structure. And then she thought about, well, what would resonate with me that way? What event have I lived through? Mine was much more um, from a sort of selfish, emotional, non-craft place of I was having a hard time getting over 9-11. And I eventually said to myself, why don't I do what I always do when I'm trying to grapple with things that have happened to me, which is to write about it. Right. So I decided I would write a book set during 9-11, but I never thought that I was really writing a book about 9-11. Mm. And it was really interesting as I got more into the characters and the story and was just setting it against this tremendous tragedy and trying to imagine what that would have felt like if I was 17 instead of 30, whatever I was at the time. And when I told both my agent and editor that I was working on a book set during 9-11, they wanted nothing to do with it. Right. So it, it, as Nora how said- many, you know, How many years was it after 9-11 that you started the book? Probably almost, almost a decade because the books came out on the 15th anniversary un, just 
coincidentally. Right. Probably like um, not maybe eight or nine years after it, mm-hmm. and still nobody wanted to hear about it, read it, talk about it. Right. And they also told us that kids wouldn't want to read it. Yeah. And it is hands down my best selling book and the book that I'm known for. And I knew that when I had gone into classrooms and said I was writing a book set during 9 11, I knew the reaction I got from young adults, from teens saying, Oh my gosh, we want to read that because. They had grown up against the backdrop of something that they had no personal connection to, but had heard about it ad nauseum and wanted to understand what it felt like versus Mm -hmm. news stories and political, you know, ramblings about it. They really wanted to know why did this change everything? Why does everybody still keep talking about it this many years later? Yeah, I have, I have one son and my oldest son was, I guess, in middle school when it happened and. I think it was very, tra- you know, defining for him. My husband was, who you both know, was in Manhattan um, when it happened, uh, not downtown. Uh, but my uh, youngest are, were twins, just born in 2000. <laughs> and I brought one of them to the 9-11 memorial in, in New York City, the museum. And it was so interesting to see he had no memory. You know, I was, they, they show as you go, it, it could delves deeper into some of the details in, in the exhibit. And um, at the end, it was all these letters and, you know, and flowers and pictures of everybody leaving um, memories and, and putting a flag outside, you know, their mailbox or their, their wind, you know, their house. And he just, you know, it was just like astonishing to me, of course, that he, you know, he had no idea that this, right. it was, you know, so, um, but I can see how, how valuable it is, you know, for, uh, him and if when he's in, you know if he were in middle school reading this book, yeah. So and you- the, the thing that Nora and I just feel so strongly about with our books is that they're not books we wrote to teach. They're books we wrote for people to feel, and okay. they're non didactic. They're not history lessons. They're not. I mean, they're historical fiction. We worked really hard to get the facts right and mm-hmm. everything authentic, but. We were trying to write good stories that would make readers feel, and that was it. And what what reaction or what kind of questions do you get when you go to to schools? Like if they're in middle school, right? They 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 were born after this happened. Yeah, there isn't a child left in school from um, twelfth grade down who was alive. You know, who was born. I um we've gotten very astonishing reactions. Um, I guess the most important one I can think of is the misinformation that kids have had, have Um, kids that think that it was um, the Iraqis who attacked us, where not one of the terrorists was from Iraq, you know, because that makes sense, right? That's what they thought. Um, A lot of them, um, there, there were so many things they didn't, they didn't know, and they ask us a lot of questions. Um, and like Gay said, because we made them personal stories, um, the kids got a much better sense of what it was like then, rather than hearing, well, like Gay said, a textbook or a teacher talking. They they connect and relate to these characters, and they learn they learn a lot, but it's through story. Mm-hmm. And, um, I don't know. I, the biggest thing for me was that boy who said he thought he, he knew that we were attacked by Iraq. Um, Gay, did, you must have some, I, I know you have like something very profound that happened one time to you, right? Am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> well, I think for me, because my readers are usually 10th grade or older for this book, though I definitely have 7th and 8th and ninth graders, but usually its sweet spot is 10th grade and there's some language in it. I think that the kids are just more, um, I mean, I've literally had kids tell me that it's the first and only book they ever wanted to read. And they've reached out to me on social media when you have a 17 year old boy reaching out to you and saying, I just want to tell you that I've never read a book cover to cover before. And I read this book and it really moved me. Um, That sense of, again, setting it against tragedy. I think that's what they relate to. How do we recover 
from tragedy. So we've often more lately been talking about the fact that these books are instructive during the pandemic or post pandemic. Yeah, these yeah. kids are, are, are going through, you know, there are similarities, the longer mm -hmm. the pandemic goes on, the similarities change, but mm -hmm. it's basically how do we cope when the world around us feels like it's falling apart. And I think our kids, um, middle grade and high school kids and younger are dealing with that question very much right now. And so it's instructive just from an emotional standpoint. So it resonates in ways you couldn't have anticipated when the book, uh, you know, when you were writing it or when it was pub first published. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and another huge connection that, that another astonishing thing I have to say, I learned going around to schools after writing this book was I had did not understand the impact on teachers in schools that day. Often it was the first week of school. If they were first time teachers, there was no precedent for this about how to behave and what to do. And they were heroes. I mean, they need to be considered frontline workers, frontline, mm -hmm. um, you know, first responders. And the same is with the pandemic. Like, I think Gay was, Gay was the one who made that connection for us. Um, teachers are frontline first responders, you know, they're, they're yeah. traumatized by what they had to go through. Um, so I was actually in the elementary school oh. <laughs> at Hurlbut, which is, you know, where the kids went to school, my, my youngest, and there was a, a PTO meeting and the principal got a note and just went on. But then I saw he got another note and then he just said, he didn't say anything, but just, you know, go home. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. And I, I think this, the kids were all dismissed, you know, early, but nobody had any idea. No, no, what to do. Yeah. Hard to explain that yeah. on the spot. I tried to put it in the book. In fact, the, my scene in the book is what yeah. happened at Weston Middle School. Oh. I, I just <laughs> pulled it right out of my kid's mouth. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, so let me uh, ask you, what, uh, Nora, did you always know you wanted to be a writer? Or, or what? at what point did you know you wanted to be a writer? <laughs> yeah, Gay and I have also very different stories about that. We've been doing this, you know, for a long time. We, we What is the expression? Lift boats, waters rising, lift more boats. <laughs> hey, what do you say? How, what is it? Or whatever it is. We, we've been helping each other for a long time. So we've talked about this. And I will make it really brief. But um, when I was in sixth grade, and had had a very traumatic childhood and lost two mothers and had you know a whole big mess came to sixth grade got suspended from school i was failing i was smoking cigarettes my sixth grade english teacher read one of my stories out loud and um from that moment on i decided not to act out not to get in trouble not to smoke and shoplift <laughs> anymore but to be a writer and and that's as corny and factual and true as as I can tell it. And did you start out writing poems or stories or? No, it's funny. I started out little novels and I illustrated oh. them. And then, you know, kids go through their poetry stage because they're fast. But um, I was writing full novels by high school. Wow. You know, on my little typewriter, we didn't have, you know, computers. Wow, that would have been nice. But, you know, banging it out on my, <laughs> my typewriter. Okay, uh, and Gay, how about you? Are your uh, Gay? Everyone is uh, to tell everyone is an, a lawyer, right? You practiced many years as a family uh, law attorney. Mm -hmm. So, how did you decide to become a writer? Nora and I are such yin yang, aren't we? We like <laughs> whatever story we have. It's opposite. Uh, Even our coloring, we're light and yeah, dark. Yin yang, yeah. <laughs> oh, I got it on go. my arm. We love each other too. We've been doing this for a long time together. Um, but yeah, my story, I mean, I did, I wrote poetry and short stories as a kid and my teachers praised my writing, but being a writer was the farthest thing from my mind. And after college, I went to law school and became an attorney mm -hmm. and I actually still practice law occasionally when the cases come to me, I don't seek them out, but I'm a mediator now. So I don't really do any litigation. I do family law mediation and it uses a whole different side of my brain. So I still do that when the cases come in. Um, 
I make more money doing that than I do writing. <laughs> but, uh, but being a published author was not my wildest dreams. It was beyond a wildest dream. It was not even something I thought about. And it wasn't until my 30s, after I had my first son and was pregnant with my second son, that I missed the creative side of me and just said, let me sit down and write. I haven't done it in a long, long time other than legal briefs. Mm -hmm. and motion papers. And so I tried to write a novel and it went from there. And what, what does, you know, novel did you start writing and did you stick to what you started? Mm. No, I wrote a piece of women's fiction and I entered it into the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award contest, which was supposed to be the American Idol of books. Uh-huh. And... I made it fairly far in that contest, but I, I I got cut at sort of the second to last cut before you got the publishing deal. And that manuscript got me an agent, but it never sold to publishers. And then I wrote another piece of women's fiction and that also never sold to publishers. And by then my kids were eight and 10 and I wrote a book for them. And that became my first published novel. So, yeah. And I still have desires. Both Nora and I still uh, work on all sorts of different genres. And I have mm-hmm. three pieces of women's fiction started. I have a novel in verse started. You know, it, I still have great desire to publish in, you know, in a, a piece of women's fiction or an adult novel at some point in time. But it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when you what is your process like? <clears throat> Do you start, you know, and write every day for a few hours? Um, Do you take, you know, big breaks between the books as you, you know, write them? Um, Yeah. Nora, do you want to go first? I'll I'll jump in um, and I'll plug my little, I've been, Gay's right, we, writers just write, right? We write, we we write whatever we feel. Like I said, we're not looking for, um, you know, assignments. So I've been lately writing um, about writing on this blog that I have um, called wordonion.us. So I've been, oh, there you go. (laughs) Very cool. So I've been writing about, about writing. My process is to always be writing something. I wake up. um, Oh, that's so cool. Those are my father's illustrations. He was an artist. Oh, that's Um, awesome. My process is I get up early in the morning and I want to wake up and have something to do. I mean, my 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 love is getting up and writing. So whether it's a novel I'm working on with Gay or like she said, you know, another novel or a short story or um, these little blogs that I've been loving doing, they're immediate um, and I'm getting nice feedback. Uh, so I'm an early morning writer. Um, you know, I just heard somebody speaking about this. When you get up really early in the morning, and then I'll, I'll leave it at that. When you get up very early before emails come in and, you know, there's nothing on Twitter and nobody's calling you, you've prioritized writing in your day. And I thought that was a really nice way of putting it. It's, you know, I, I have to walk my dog first <laughs> and I have to have coffee. <laughs> and then it's with the computer. So. Uh-huh. Well, it's, you have a, a, a clear head, I guess, you know, there's nothing, uh, you know, things yeah. to do or. It's quiet. You know, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And you gay? So for me, yes. unless I'm really engrossed in a manuscript right. and then this might shift um, five to seven months a year, the first thing I'm doing when I wake up most mornings is going and swimming in the open water. Um, you swim so, in the sound? Uh, yeah, I swim in the harbor and the sound. Uh, uh-huh. And so it's interesting to hear Nora say that because it's true. That is the sort of the quiet hour before everything starts piling up on you. So it's a big choice that I make. But those five to seven months a year, the choice I make is to go swim Um So I probably write more productively in the winter months than I do in the summer months. Um, I definitely don't write every day, but 
if I am engrossed in a manuscript. I, you know, my writing life has changed drastically since 2016 and since the pandemic. It has been challenging for me. I would, you know, in the beginning of the election and the first couple of years after it, I was marching and doing tons of activism, mm -hmm. joined an activist group. And so really, you know, I think my priorities can, they can be swimming, they can be activism, they can be writing, they can be my kids um, and my dog. So I am not one of the people that fit the mold of, you know, you need to write every day. And okay. I still consider myself a writer. <laughs> but, but, but. Yeah. As we talk about a lot, writing is all the time. Writing yeah. is when you're swimming. Writing yeah. is when you're at a march. Writing is all the times you're thinking and feeling and experiencing life. Like um, I, Ann Patchett wrote a, it was a speech. She said the greatest um, experience or, or education to being a writer was when she was a waitress, you know, yeah. and experiencing people and life. So um, I, you're writing all the time, whether you're sitting in front of the computer or not. And I think that's actually, Nora, a great point you just made for people who tuned in because this said the art of writing and that we were going to talk about how to write. I just think that what Nora said is there are, th there are two things you need to do to be a, a writer or a, or a successful writer or a productive writer. One is you need to read. Yes. And the other is you need to live. Yes. And um, don't underestimate the fact that, you know, you see periodically that I referenced it, that circulating philosophy that if you don't write every day, you're not a writer. That's BS. Um, yeah. I feel pretty strongly about that. And, and I do some of my best writing in the water. And then my challenge is for it to sound as good on paper as it yeah. did in my head while I was swimming. But for those of you who are saying, you know, I, I want to write and I don't know how to get started, think about what you might want to write while you're doing the other things that you love, be it running or swimming or gardening or walking your dog, because that is writing. Thank you, Nora. It's true. I don't I, don't, I definitely also don't write every day. I, I just want it just what do I wake up and want to what is excites me and um which Gay's right. It, I definitely, that idea that you have to write every day for an hour or so, I don't, I don't um, ascribe or prescribe. To that. I'll only say for myself, uh, I studied in college at Queens College with uh, poet Marie Ponceau, and she had seven children that she was raising. And so she had been published before her children in mm -hmm. City Lights books, this, you know, a long time ago with, during the time of the beats. And and then she had these seven children and mm. she was to make money. She was translating French fables, but she said always, you know, there was, she always wrote for 10 minutes a day for mm. her. I guess that was really key to, to get those 10 minutes in no matter, you know, where and when, but she, she wouldn't, you know, close her eyes until the, she had those 10 minutes. So, um, which is something I've kept in mind as I have a busy life. <laughs> you know, when I'm teaching writing, and my students have embarked on a manuscript, I will tell them to try to write 20 minutes a night, even if it's before bed, even if it's garbage. So it may depend where you are in the writing phase. I think the thing that Nora and I want to emphasize is that you're still a writer if you don't write every day, but certainly if it works for you to write every day, or there are periods of time where you should write every day because it will keep the momentum going. Um, it can be really important to try to do that because especially if you're at the beginning of things and you don't yet view yourself as a writer, then it's easy to lose complete track of it if you're not trying to be there every day for, you know, a few minutes at least. Okay. And do you ever, you know, I think a lot of people have this fear of the, you know, uh, the blank page, you know, does that exist for you or are you just start writing whatever it is and just go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, um, I don't, I've never been for lack of ideas. I don't think I'm not a, um, a believer in the idea of, um, I think this just goes back to the last question. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a believer in writer's block. I think sometimes you just need to not be writing. Um, mm -hmm. 
and, mm -hmm. and living, doing something else. So I wouldn't write without inspiration. I, I, don't, I would not sit down and write for the sake of writing. I don't think Gay would do that either. Um, am I right? I don't. I, I wouldn't force myself to sit down and write for an hour. I w I have an inspiration, and that may take brainstorming. Like I, you know, I paper all around me. That may take, um, you know, writing some ideas. I always have an idea file, but I, I I really wouldn't. I need to be inspired. I need to be passionate. You're talking about staying with something for a year or two or three, you better really be passionate about it. And it may take, it may take months, days, weeks, a year to, to become passionate about something. I, I would, Gay, you probably feel the same, right? I don't think you'd force yourself to. No, lately. So I said, you know, since 2016 and then since the pandemic, I haven't been as creative, but one of the things that I uh, have done is returned more to my poetry roots. So I know you can appreciate appreciate this, Rose, but you know, I have a medium page and I put my poems up there sometimes. And I have a friend who's a poet and we have a Google Doc where we trade poems. But if I haven't been writing a lot, I will try to go write a poem. So sometimes that's something I do is is if I'm feeling like I want to write, but I don't have the inspiration for a larger work, I will turn to poetry and feel like, well, if I create a poem today, I'll have kept my, my, my fluids, you know, my creative <laughs> fluids going kind of oiled, well oiled. You do. Um, no, I totally, I totally agree. And teaching writing is, has the same uh, passion. So um, you know, lately I've been working with people on their manuscripts and, and, and I'm not actually writing, but I'm brainstorming. I'm, 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 I'm collaborating in a creative process and it's, it's also exciting. Um, so we're, we're always doing something some, somewhere. Well, it sounds like you're both really curious and that's a big mm. part of, of being a writer, I think, and, and being passionate about, you know, a lot of different things uh, as well as, you know, taking in things. So um, we have a comment from, Lucio, who's looking, who's joining us from Long Island. And we had one about your books, Andrea Lynn, Carmel and Pavlik, uh, both amazing book, books, she's saying. Um, Anna, Anna Ariaga is watching and listening uh, from Long Island. So thanks for being um, here. So uh, I, I, as a founder of Women to Follow, uh, which I started as a hashtag saying, you know, let's name Women to Follow. And I have, there's a list of 1800 on Twitter. Uh, and uh, so the idea is, you know, to, in a positive way, you know, for, for women uh, to have their voices, to hear women's voices. Uh, so I, I always ask my guests. Um, so Nora, can you tell us who you would name as some of your women to follow? Um, I think um, I, are you going to put this? Yeah, the first person I put up is my... <laughs> Is because I can't remember. No, I definitely remember. I just, I, um, I first chose my college roommate, uh, who is the person who introduced me to the issue of mass incarceration, which became very important to me. And I wrote a book about it. And I began working with women in prison. It's Jill Becker, Dr. Jill Becker. And she is now involved in Bedford, New York with the, um, the idea committee it's uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the schools. So um, she, she just is a big, she's, she was an activist from the day I met her, yeah. and she still is. And, and Gay and I both are friends with Una, Mrs. Okay. Um, she's, she, she's one of those teachers extraordinaire, and, and she reads voraciously. Like, I, she, I don't know how she sleeps. But she's a wonderful, intelligent, supportive role model and mentor for teachers. And um, Gay and I have both worked with her before. So um, she's wonderful. And I wanted to give a shout out to Joy Hanaline, who who is the executive director of it's called Click. Um, I'm going to get that. It's Connecticut Literacy. No, Connecting Through Literacy and something, something, something. Incarcerated parents, their children and caregivers. Thank you. We call it click. And um, she's an uh, she's an amazing woman, Joy Hanaline. She, she works in the prison with the moms, 
uh, Scholastic donates books to moms and the kids on the outside. They read the books together and then have and then have discussions about the books because oftentimes it's very hard for the kids and the mothers to, you know, know what to talk about. It can be uncomfortable. So through literacy, they they connect and she's the one that brought me into the the prisons to work with the moms and the kids. So she's a wonderful woman. That's really awesome. And the teacher you mentioned, does she, what grade does she teach? I'm, I'm curious. She just got a position as a, as the director of, of English language at, um, at, uh, she calls it the Panthers. I, I can't remember the name of the school um, in okay. New Jersey. It's in New okay. Jersey. Mm -hmm. And um, she's the director of edu of English language now. Mm -hmm. She's got this big job. So we're very happy for her. That's awesome. Uh, so Gay, tell us tell us who, who we should know about and follow. So first of all, Rose, what a phenomenal thing you've done. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, amazing hashtag. And then when you ask this question, I I know Nora did the same thing. There's so many amazing women that I wanted to name and lift, I, I, I could give you a hundred of them. And this happens to be my sister-in-law's sister. She has a podcast that um, she played Lucy on Broadway in You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, many years ago. She's also in the uh, famous The Contest episode of Seinfeld. But she oh. has turned to... Mm -hmm, but she has turned <laughs> to podcasting and she huh? does a podcast very centered around... Um, Broadway actors and musical theater. Fantastic and fun. Cool. Um, Kelly Hager is a blogger that I've known since my first book came out. And she um, playfully says that, uh, you know, she's kind of a misery movie stalker, Kathy Bates stalker. Um, <laughs> we become friends, but we met because she loved my first book and she has been just supporting me and so many other authors and not big authors, smaller authors yeah. for many, many years. She's phenomenal. And she also has a podcast. Amy Allen Clark, amazing. She hosts the uh, podcast as well now, but she has the Mom Advice blog. And I will tell you that if you subscribe for the newsletter, it's the only newsletter I get in my email that I don't immediately delete as soon <laughs> as it comes in. It's chock full of wonder things and she's just an awesome human being and this is my younger son's girlfriend who I is knew it I knew that <laughs> incredible singer songwriter in her own right she's signed to Warner Records and she, she's had some trauma in her life and her songwriting is poignant and beautiful and her voice is magnificent I'm gonna That's I'm awesome. gonna Agree. And and she <laughs> sings with Gay's son, who's also oh. a singer songwriter out in LA. And together uh -huh. uh, you cry when you just watch them together that, you know, it's, it's quite beautiful. So up you'll have to tell me when I can see them sometime if they're in New York city. <laughs> so I think she's coming okay. to New York actually in September. Oh. So, okay, cool. Uh, well, it's a really great, um, the great woman to follow in, in different fields and, uh, I'll be, I'll put out something. And if you want to add to when I put out some tweets about the, the woman to follow, please go ahead and, and get, get a thread going. You know, that would be awesome. Find. I might add a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, you can. Um, just, uh, and uh, just before we, we part, uh, I want to ask uh, Nora to tell us a little about the book she wrote, anything but typical and what, you know, how it was, which is about a boy with autism. So yeah, I it was an ex it, I I am very interested in structure and um I wrote this as the first person point of view from a, a an autistic a boy diagnosed with autism and and this the interesting structure to me was how do you portray the world around this boy even if he's not actually experiencing it the way I wanted the reader to experience it. So that was a challenge. Um, and autism was at the time all over the news and all over the news was like, how do we cure this? How do we fix it? It came from peanut butter. It came from shots. It came from blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, I have issues. 
um, <laughs> that someone might want to cure. And, and you know, I, I work towards that, but I want to be accepted instead of tolerated. And I would like people to um, have empathy for me rather than sympathy. And I think, so those were the issues that I, those were the themes that I had of the book. Um, my character is okay with who he is. I, I do, I have to always emphasize that Jason, the character in the book, is a high functioning autistic boy. You know, um, there are very severely autistic children that I would not, uh, you know, begin to write about. But there were so many similarities between Jason and myself, just so many, that it really was not hard to become him and jump into his skin and his life and his ears and his eyes and um, speak to something about acceptance. It's a universal um, issue. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, all our books in some way speak to that empathy instead of sympathy and um, acceptance, not tolerance is what everybody wants. That's what we all want. So, um, and that book, like Gay was saying, in our field, um, you need one book to do well in order to keep publishing. So for me, that book won um, the Schneider Family Book Award and uh, allowed me to continue publishing, which is just, it's what we want. We want to be writers. Oh, now we have Consider the Octopus. So, <laughs> it's, well, I guess we don't have a picture of the book with us, unless one of you has has a cover. But uh, so... Uh, this is, this is the other book they've written together. Um, the book we're talking about is called Anything But Typical. Uh, and you can, here it is, um, and you can find it um, on Amazon and, you know, look at Nora's website for, um, it looks, it got very good reviews and it's a fascinating kind of idea. And the idea that, you know, you, in a way, used your, the structure of acceptance versus, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, versus, versus tolerance. Tolerance to guide you in, in that mind of, of yes. telling us about this boy. Yep. It was, mm -hmm. it, it was autism acceptance, which is a hashtag mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, autism awareness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was, that was when I knew what, what, this is what I'm going to write about. Now I got it. Now I have his voice. Now I understand. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Well, I really, uh, so, so many, uh, wise words, um, from both of you. Uh, so thank you. Um, and I'll just ask you um, if there's any one piece of advice you would give to uh, people wanting to become writers or, or kids wanting to, to write. You got one gay. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, as I said, read and live, but also um, I always think of the Nike slogan, just do it. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking today that, you know, write that crappy first draft that's been banging around in your head or heart forever. I have so many people say they have a book or story they want to tell, but they don't know where to start and they don't know how to do it. And, and just do it and write the crappy version. Our first drafts are usually range from awful to terrible and then put it away and then come back to it later and find the gems and find the starting place and find, if you don't have a book, it doesn't matter if you know where your starting place is. So mm -hmm. you might as well just write the crappy version and then come back later and make it pretty. That's what most of us do. Very few of us write a good first draft and that's an understatement. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would you also are. add, you know, write what you're passionate about. Find, you know, don't try to write what you think someone else will like, write what you want to read and um, someone will like it. Um, and, and don't tell anybody what you're writing about until, until you're, <laughs> until you're pretty secure in it. Cause the worst thing is someone will say, Oh, what, what are you writing? What, what are you writing about? And you'll tell them and they'll go, they'll kind of go, Oh, Oh, and then you'll never want to write again because it'll just destroy you. So keep it, <laughs> keep it safe for a while. Keep it in your heart and yourself until you're ready. And then show it to really nice people. <laughs> <laughs> people you can trust. Yes. So Andrea is asking a good question. Um, do you have another collaboration in the works? We don't right now. We're... I, 
I think both of us have gone off into kind of, we're both working on adult things. And then we're doing these little other, like Gay's writing her poetry and I've been doing these blogs about writing and, um, but right now we don't. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll stay tuned and look at, uh, I'll be looking at your website, Nora, to see your writing and following you, uh, Gay. Uh, and Annette Noel, I don't know if you know her. She's saying great advice. Thank you for the, thanks for this wonderful conversation. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you so much. It really it was really a rich and uh, rich and uh, inspiring conversation. So uh, if you can just hang around, I'm just going to say goodbye. And if you could just hang around backstage in the green room, I'll see you in two minutes. <laughs> thank you so much, Rose. Thank you. Thank you, Gay. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this, uh, I started the show a, a year, it'll be a year in August, the end of August. Uh, so it's really been a, a great ride and uh, terrific to meet so many uh, fascinating women. Uh, and I hope you'll join me for the next show. I'll uh, announce it on Twitter and uh, all the other channels. So stay tuned and uh, thank you so much for joining me. <laughs>